Hello, my name is Philip Sweezy. I'm a math teacher in Shawville, Quebec, Canada. This presentation is about the secondary four math exams and is based on the information documents, exam schedule, and guide for parents from the ministry website. Links to these documents can be found on the exam prep page on the Learn website. You can see the link below on the bottom right, learnquebec.ca backslash exam prep. In this presentation, I will be speaking to you about both the Secondary 4 Math CST and Math SN exams that you will be doing in the near future. First, we will be discussing what you can bring into the exam with you and what you should not have on you when you go to write your exam. We will follow this up with what you will see on the day of the exam. And we will look at how the exam is broken up into three separate parts. We will Additionally, be looking at a few sample questions from each of those sections. And at the end, I'll talk briefly about the way the exam will be graded. This is the list of the authorized materials for the June exam. When you arrive, at minimum, you should at least have a pencil, preferably a couple. But the other main materials I would highly suggest bringing would be a ruler a calculator, and a memory aid. The calculator itself should be something that you are very familiar with and have currently been using, so you don't run into any problems with the calculator's operating functions. And lastly, we will spend more time discussing this later, but a well-written and personalized memory aid is key to your success in writing this exam. There are also unauthorized materials, and just so that you are aware, the ministry is very strict about what you bring into the exam session. We recommend that you pause this slide and read it carefully. The only digital devices allowed have been previously identified in your IP and authorized by your school board prior to the exam. Pay attention to the line regarding smartphone, wireless headphones, earbuds, or smartwatches. This is also a slide I would take time to read carefully. There are many important aspects to using calculators. Some of your calculators may have a memory function. It is important that you remove and delete any stored data in the memory if it has one. If you're unsure about your own, please consult your teacher before you enter the exam. The only other advice I would give is for you to understand a few buttons on your calculators before you walk in. Do you know how to find all the right trig buttons? Can you find sine, cosine, tan? Do you know how to get the inverse of those to help find an angle? Do you know how to find an angle, whether it would be with sine law or trigonometry? And please, please, please double check that your calculator is in degrees, not radians or gradients. You will see this on the top section, whether it be a D, DEG, across the top of the graphic display. This is something, again, that you should check with your teacher prior to the exam. The only other added part that you should be aware of is the exponent button. What does it look like on your calculator? This is the one button that varies depending upon the brand of calculator that you have. So yours may be different than your friends. This is something that you should confirm and double check with your teacher again before you use it. Preparing the memory aid. Please note that there is a how to make a memory aid video included on the Learn website in the exam preparation resource list. Memory aids are vital to your success when writing a ministry exam. Obviously, it goes without saying that you can include important formulas, but don't forget to utilize examples that demonstrate how to break down different types of questions. Although the questions won't be exactly the same, the examples do a great job of jogging your memory. Keep in mind that diagrams can be helpful as well. A good chunk of this year relates to functions, which are better understood sometimes when using visuals. 
The organization of one's memory aid is as varied as snowflakes, but ensure that it makes sense to you. Use different colors or separate the different concept with borders so that you can easily find what you need. My best piece of advice is that creating and recreating a memory aid until it is perfect is a great way to study. Making one forces you to review and find the most relevant information in the course and organize it in a way that makes sense to you. Do not, I repeat, do not just blindly copy the memory aid of your smartest friend. If you didn't make it, why would it benefit you? Use the creation of this tool as your best weapon to pass this exam. Writing the exam, what to expect. When you arrive in the examination room, you will be provided with the exam booklets. Be sure that you know where to write your answers, including on the scannable answer sheet. You can start with whichever section you prefer. Maybe you will gain confidence by starting with multiple choice. Perhaps you would like to get the long answer questions out of the way. Feel free to do what works best for you, but this is just a word of warning. Be careful not to spend too much time on one question. Summary of the exam. Take a look at the weighting of the three sections. Note that part B questions are worth 16%. You will want to manage your time accordingly. I've seen many students get caught up on those four little short answer questions that are only worth 16%. Each of your long answers are worth 10% apiece. Take time on the long answer application questions that you feel the most comfortable with and show all of your work to ensure you squeeze every mark out of them. We will dive into this a little later when we look at some examples as well as the rubric used to evaluate you. Keywords and concepts. For those of you that need things in bullet point form or like to take a bird's eye view, here are all of the keywords and concepts you should be familiar with for both the SEC4SN and the CST exams. Note that there is a lot of overlap between the two courses, but as you can see in the first column, there are additional, more challenging concepts that you will need to know. This should be a good reference table to review when you're making your memory aid. My suggestion is to use this as a sort of checklist. If you are missing any one of these items, go back and see if you can find room. This specific table is for those taking the 10 CST exam. Similar to the last table that you saw on the previous slide, this goes further into detail about what processes or different concepts you will be evaluated on. When prepping your memory aid, keep in mind that the arithmetic and algebra section make up 38%. The stats section will make up 12%. And the analytical geometry section will make up 50% of the exam. Keep that in mind when deciding the concepts that you want to include in your memory aid and how much space they deserve. Take your time reading through the sections. Cross-check them with your memory aid. Is there anything missing? This is the concepts and processes that it will be evaluated for the secondary four science option exam. So the SN exam. This is a more detailed breakdown of all of the concepts and processes that you will be evaluated on. The one thing I will point out is that the arithmetic and algebra section will comprise 55% of the overall exam. 
the stats, only 8%. And the geometry and analytical geometry, 37%. Keep those things in mind when you're creating your memory aid and what space you should allot for each concept. Part A of the exam is multiple choice. As always, exams where scantrons are used, be careful when filling in the answer you want. My suggestion would be to work on a separate sheet and ensure you are happy with all your answers before you go and fill it in, in case you may have to erase one. Please note that there is only one answer per multiple choice. Sample question for part A. This would be a question you would see on both the 10 CST and SN exam. It is a great example that will have you demonstrate your understanding of correlation coefficient. As you approach these questions, break it into two sections. The left column is essentially just a label. The right are the values you have to evaluate. For this concept, there are three things to consider. What constitutes a weak correlation? How close are the numbers to one? Does it matter that the number is negative or positive? Here are some helpful strategies for tackling multiple choice questions. Number one, answer questions first, then look at the choices after. Number two, for true or false questions, Review all four choices first, and then select your answer. The next slide will indicate what the answer will be. As you can see, I've rewritten the question. I've put the label on the left-hand side and rewritten the linear correlation coefficient values. The question was requesting us to order it from weakest to strongest. In this case, we're not concerned whether or not it's positive or negative. We're more concerned with the actual value itself and how close that number is to one. So remove any negative and see which number is closest to one. The closer it is, the higher the correlation coefficient the stronger the correlation coefficient. In this case, in order to order it from weakest to strongest, we would start with number two, negative 0.45, number three, positive 0.72, and lastly, number one, negative 0.87. As such, the final answer would be C because the order was two, three, one. Part B of the exam. Now this consists of four short answer questions and is where you do not want to get hung up. They should be relatively straightforward. So look to your memory aid to find the formula or formulas you may need. In the next couple of slides, we will look at an example. Sample question for part B. This specific question is looking at metric relations. However, this was not included in the priority content and should not be included on the end of year ministry June exam. But this is a perfect example of a short answer question that you will typically see. You'll be provided with a little bit of information. They've given you everything already labeled all you have to do is identify the one segment, KT. When it comes to math, always ask yourself three questions. What is it that I need? What do I currently have? What can I solve with what I have? Please always remember to add the correct units of measure if indicated.
Now, this slide here is how I walk through it. I will point out that I put the formulas up top. You may have yours written in a different way. And working with students across Quebec, I've seen this in a myriad of different formats. So as such, this is the one specific way that I've done it, but it may be different than yours. In addition to what was currently labeled, I also decided to add in the full distance from S to V, 800 units, by combining the 288 and the 512. I then went and wrote down my objective, find out the length of KT. Now on this one here, it's important to label everything you have, even that 800 we just found. When it comes to these formulas, and even when you're doing questions like trigonometry with SOHCAHTOA, look for the formula that has two out of the three. Choose the one that will work for you in this scenario. In this case, you will notice that you can find KT easily because we already have SK and KV. As of right now, this is the only formula that will work as we have two out of the three and can easily solve for the remaining one on the left hand side. In terms of where you will likely make your mistake, most people will forget to take the square root as the last step and leave the long number there. Be careful to execute your formulas all the way to the end. Part C is the meat of the exam. This is where your memory aid will truly come in handy. The best way to prepare for this section is to fully understand how it is being evaluated. We will look into the rubric in greater detail later, but do not get hung up if the answers don't work out in your favor or make sense given the context of the situation provided. Just ensure you are demonstrating your understanding of how you would execute the problem and that you understand the concept and processes that are being evaluated on these long answer questions. Part C comprises 60% of the mark for this exam. The long answer section, as I just said, comprises 60% of the exam. There are two category types of questions. Category one is pretty straightforward, as you can see from the paragraph here. But let's talk about category two that involve proofs, conjectures, and counterexamples. The shape proof is a more common question that is provided. In this case, you should already have a table set up for this. How do I prove an isosceles trapezoid? Well, I'm going to need two parallel lines and two lines opposite that that have the exact same distance. My table will inform me of that. This is why we have memory aids. But there are other types of proofs. What do these look like? A proof is when you're trying to actually make sense and prove whether or not a statement is true or false. The best way to do this is to provide and solve an example. And in this instance, use letters in place of numbers and try and walk through and prove the statement. Conjectures, also in category two, are similar to proofs. However, they require you to describe a relationship that you can see based on the conjecture provided. In this case, use examples, use numbers, try out three separate sets of points or slopes or any given values that fit the scenario that you see in front of you. Execute all three examples. Try to see a relationship 
and at the end, describe the relationship you saw. Counterexamples are the opposite of a proof. You're trying to provide an example to see if you can disprove a true or false statement. For these examples, you don't have to stop at three. Try as many as you can that you think might break the statement, provided your objective is to likely prove that what you're looking for is not true. The best advice I can give for these is to try to take advantage of what you know about the parameters, whether it be A, H, K, or zeros with parabolas, and think about what you know about these parameters and how they impact parabolas and the way they are graphed. Is there a way you can play around with some numbers by making them larger, making them decimals, making them positive or negative that will help disprove the statement that was provided to you? In this case, it's you just demonstrating your full awareness of these concepts. This breakdown shows that those taking the CST option only have one complex long answer question, whereas the science option students have two. This is just for the long answer part C section. Remember, not all of these complex questions are the same. The question might be a challenging one that incorporates tough mental reasoning, or it could be a proof. Remember not to spend too much time though on any one question. Find the concepts and questions that you find the easiest and squeeze every mark out of them so that you show all of your work. Be sure to validate and double check your answers as well. Did my answer make sense given the diagram or the situation? If not, write that out next to it or try validating it and going through and executing the formula again. Sample question for part C, category one, CST option. This would fall under the concept of analytical geometry. Now they've given you a bullet point list of information next to the diagram in the Cartesian plane. There. Start by labeling everything you know. Some students actually find it helpful to place the rule on the line itself in the hopes that maybe that might let them see something that they wouldn't see when it was in the bullet list. Another approach is to write things out under different headings. You see line QH, there's QH. I'm gonna label everything I know under that, that H is has an X value of 150 and an unknown Y, that Q is on the X intercept, okay? Additionally, I would then also write out what I know about VJ. Well, I already have point J. And the only other thing I know is that V is two fifths along segment QH. So I'll likely need to get H and Q before I can find out what V is. If you're stuck when you're looking at questions like this, always remember the three questions. What do I need? line segment vj what do i have this point the two-fifths everything we've labeled and what can i solve with what i have so at least you know that hey i can do division point or hey i can point plug in that 150 and solve for h or i can plug in the y is zero and get the x intercept these questions are really tough because most students find it hard on knowing where to start but as I've always said, uh, what can I solve with what I have is an important question. If you just start to fill those pieces in, it might start to make sense. Let's take a look on the next slide, how we would solve it. As you can see here, I've kind of put everything down into steps. I've labeled everything. 
You can see I've even put the 150 and Y up there. I've put X and zero right here as a placeholder, and I put the rule right along that line right there. Now, the first thing that I would solve for, and this is just me, is I'd go ahead and find that Q. Knowing that it is the X intercept, I am fully aware that the Y value is zero. So that means I just take Y is equal to three X minus 180, set that to zero, and then rearrange and solve till I get an X of 60. Now I will add that to the diagram, further creating the picture of what it is that I have, okay? Step three, I would solve for H because I'm solving for what I can get with what I have. Well, I also know that H has an X of 150 and I still have that same rule. So if I have an X of 150, well, I can just plug that in and solve. And when I went through that, I found that I got a Y value of 270. So not only do I have a Y of 270, I actually have that point H in full now, 150 and 270, 150 and 270. And I also have this 60 and zero, which means I have enough information now to find point V which is two fifths along that line. I will then use the division point formula to solve for point V. A note to those doing the SN curriculum, you would not have seen this division point formula as it is not included. For 10 CST, this is something that you should be very comfortable with. Keep in mind that because it said located two fifths and not ratio, I can just use that fraction two fifths and not have to convert the ratio to a fraction to put it in front in division point. Once I went through and solved this division point question and got V, I now have point V and I already had point J. So the last step would just be to solve for the distance Using my distance formula, please do not forget to take the square root at the end. There were no units of measurement, so you can just write out 170 units as they didn't give you meters, kilometers, centimeters, or anything in this case. Sample question for part C, the inequality, also an analytical geometry question that deals with inequalities. So first off, I want you to notice that inequality in the shaded section. This should be something that you should be well aware of, as well as what that shaded line and region may represent. In addition, you should take note that the line segment that goes through NS is a solid line. When you have a question that asks you to describe the half plane, it is asking you to write out the rule of that line NS and give the inequality associated with it. So this shaded region here. That would make the section you see in that diagram, the shaded section right there. In this instance, because it is a solid line, because it's shaded, you know that you'll be using the less than equal to symbol once you find the base rule, y equals mx plus b or y equals ax plus b, depending upon what your teacher is using. So then on top of that, I would use the less than and equal to. As mentioned earlier, I would label everything that you have. Some students like to write the rules that apply on the actual diagram itself. So I'll put that n to q would be 2x minus 3y plus 180. Maybe you'll start to see what you can do with it once you put it on the diagram. However, feel free to rearrange it to see if you can get more information. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. What if I rearranged it? 
It is important to always label things clearly in these questions. I always instruct my students to put headings for each, the different line segments, and then beneath that, the information that you know about each of those segments. So we have NS, and we have NQ, and we have SV. And what do we know about those? What can we use with them? You can see right here, the equation of the line SV is that. So I'm hoping you've used symmetric form before and you can say that the x-intercept would be negative 32 and zero and that the y-intercept would be zero and eight. Does that make sense given the actual diagram that he would be zero and eight and this would be negative 32 and zero? Of course it does. And maybe that's something you wanna include on the diagram just to give yourself perspective. It also demonstrates your knowledge and awareness, symmetric form, and analytical geometry as a whole. It can't hurt. Okay. As mentioned on all the previous sort of questions, if you get stumped on a long answer, look at what you have. What do you need? And what can you solve with what you have? If you're not sure where to get started, just solve for some of the things that you think you could solve for. I will get into this in more detail on the next slide with the solution. When approaching a problem like this, it's important to label first. As you can see here, I've labeled 2x minus 3y plus 180. I've also labeled the symmetric form version of S and V. I've included as well that X is unknown and the Y is 28. I've labeled as much as I can. The only thing not on this diagram would be that NQ and NS share a Y intercept. Indicating that if I can solve it for NQ, I will also have it for NS. But let's walk through this. Now, to be fair, you can solve it in whatever way you want. There are a multitude of ways to solve these questions when it comes to analytical geometry. And you may approach it one way and the student next to you may approach it another. Both of you can come up with the same correct answer and that's okay. Find what works best for you and utilize that approach. But let's start. If my objective is to find the rule of line NS and then identify what the rule is for the half plane, the shaded region, the inequality, that's perfectly fine. If I know I need the rule of a line, I need two points. So I need N and I need S. Right off the bat, I know that N is the y-intercept of that line. So I can either rearrange the line, and then as soon as I rearrange it in y equals mx plus b form, you will see that I can get a y-intercept of 60. And then automatically I can use that guy as 0 and 60. But if you don't see that and you don't rearrange it, feel free to just use the equation that you see in front of you. Set the x value to 0 and then rearrange and solve for y. It'll still give you the same answer, but again, there are many ways to approach these problems. So now I've got a y value of 60, which means when x is zero, y would be 60. So if I have n, the only other thing I need now would be to find s. Now symmetric form, is a little bit of an awkward format. Now, if you don't necessarily like working with it in this regard and like dealing with decimals, then you can go ahead and rearrange that formula. What I decided to do in this case was to multiply by eight. If you're going to rearrange something in symmetric form, sometimes it's easier just to multiply by the denominator attached to the y. Reason being is for all of these situations, is it not easier for us to just cancel out what's attached to the Y 
to, a, to leave us with a singular Y so that we can just rearrange the rest of it and get Y is equal to AX or MX plus B. So what happened in this case is that I multiplied the entire equation by eight that allowed me to cancel out the eight in front of the Y that allowed me to simplify 8x minus 32 into negative 1 quarter x. And then the opposite side, well, 1 times 8 is just going to be 8. I was then left with y is equal to positive 1 quarter x plus 8 when I moved that negative 1 quarter x to the right-hand side of that equation. Once I had that rule, it was significantly easier to deal with. I could plug in y is 28 and then solve for what is x when y is 28. In this case, you'll see I got an, a, a point or an ordered pair of 80 and 28. Well, now I've got both my n, 0 and 60, and my s, 80 and 28, meaning I have two points on a line. The remaining part of this, step six, would be to solve for the slope of this line. I don't need to solve for the y-intercept because ns and nq share the same y-intercept. So all I had to do was label my x1, y1, x2, y2. Plug it in and solve for a negative two-fifths slope. Now, I mentioned before that it's important for you to look at the diagram, validate it based on what you see. Does it make sense that the slope would be negative? Yeah, it does. Does it make sense that it would be a decimal, two-fifths? Yes, it does. These are the things that you can write in case you find your answer doesn't fit. You can add that in a description explaining why you think you might have made a computation error. Those are all valuable items in terms of getting as many marks as you can from your evaluator. This question is specific to the SN course, but the format has been used in the past for CST as well. It is a category two, and it is a more challenging question. They are asking you to find a pattern. These questions are set up as pattern puzzles, where each section has to be solved separately. It will involve one overall concept, but each section will be covering a different process that wasn't covered in the previous section, or in this case, expression. Start, start by solving the first section and simplifying it. Factor the polynomials that need to be factored and see what can be canceled. Write out what the answer is clearly for all three of the first expressions, and then see if you can identify a pattern. At this point, write out what the pattern is in your booklet. Finally, since the last section still has to be factored, 144x squared minus 25, factor it and see how it would influence what the denominator would be, and then include what you think would go there. You should complete your answer, but writing out the pattern as well as the final answer is important to get all the marks available to you. Let's dive into this further on the next slide. Finding the pattern. Factor, simplify, add, subtract, multiply, or divide all of the rats in the previous slide and start to look for a pattern. As you can see on this first one, the first expression was group factoring. The bottom was good. 
if you feel it's necessary, label that the 2y minus 3 is good as it is and check it off. As you can see in the second expression, I've done the same for the denominator as well. Now, on the first expression, we will group factor, rewrite it out, and cancel what needs to be canceled, and then clearly state what the simplified version of that first expression would be. 2x plus 5 over 1. I've written the denominator to point out that what was below there before is now canceled. On the second expression, I've identified, and you can even feel free to add in that this is a trinomial where a is greater than 1. And in doing so, identify your knowledge of factoring. From here, I'll write out all the factors of 60 to identify what numbers I have to work with when it comes to trinomial factoring. I'll then cancel things out, rewrite it, cancel what needs to be canceled, and then identify the final answer. As I've mentioned here below, at this point, take a look and start to see if you can see a pattern. The denominator is 1. The denominator is 1. This part is 5. This part is 5. The coefficient attached to the x went from 2 to 4. So I now have two options. The 5s are the same. The 1 is the same. And the coefficient is either adding 2 or multiplied by 2. If you can't figure out the third expression, make a guess, an educated guess. Mention that you're aware of both models and say it's either going to be this one or this one. From here, we will then look at the third expression and decide how we will attack it. We will now continue a category two question. You will notice in the previous two expressions, we were dealing with a group factoring and a trinomial factoring. Not to say that we won't use those skills as well on these ones, but you will now notice that there is a division symbol. So each step or expression is asking you to approach it or demonstrate mastery of another specific process. On this one, when it comes to division, I've always suggested to flip the second rat. And as soon as you do that, you'll notice that I can go ahead and cancel the 9x plus 1 and the 9x plus 1, getting closer to a denominator of 1 at this case. So cancel if you can. Rewrite it. Identify what items are good and then factor what you actually see. I will always write out the factors that I can utilize to actually piece this together. Writing this out right here will be helpful because even if you choose the wrong ones, it'll demonstrate your understanding of knowledge of what is what has to actually be done here. Now, once I've factored it, I'll rewrite it and cancel what I can cancel again. And as you can see here, x minus 1 will cancel x minus 1. Now from here, you will notice that I have 6x plus 5. If we think back to the previous slides, and you can feel free to rewrite it, 2x plus 5 over 1. Oh, 4x plus 5 over 1. And then now 6x plus 5 over 1. No longer can I assume that it is multiply by 2 between them, but it is add 2 to the coefficient of what is in front of x. The pattern has been revealed, and as such, I can figure out what the 6 expression will be. Let's continue this in the next slide. So last but not least, I've written out 
everything I've solved for. Can you see the pattern? Do you understand what the fourth and fifth expression will be? Where they'll try and trick you is that on the table, they're asking for the sixth expression. Not the fourth, not the fifth, but the six. So then how do we turn this guy, the six expression, 144x squared minus 25 over question mark into what we know should be 12x plus five? This is the biggest step. This is the biggest leap. This is where we will start to see difficulty. The majority of you will be able to factor things, but being able to identify the pattern and then solve for what the top should be or the denominator should be will be an extra step. So if you see something that is unfactored, factor it. In this case, 144x squared minus 25 is identified as a difference of squares. So that will turn into what is the square root of 144? What is the square root of 25? This binomial turns into 12x plus 5 times 12x minus 5. Therefore, the denominator must be 12x minus 5. So those two would cancel each other out, leaving you with 12x plus 5 over 1. Not easy. Definitely not easy. But doable if you break it into steps and solve what you can with what you have in front of you. So now that we've worked through a few questions, let's take a brief look at the evaluation rubric for long answer application questions. To obtain level A and all of the criteria, you first need to demonstrate a clear understanding of the concept and process evaluated in the question. The most important thing to remember is to show everything you know about this concept. Write out your steps, label things, show your work. If you are labeling all the information and writing down what you need to do, as well as solve all of the formulas that relate to the specific question, you really are doing everything in your power to succeed and demonstrating your mastery of this concept in question. Continually remind yourself, are you showing that you know what concepts and processes are being evaluated? Do you really know that this is analytical geometry, factoring, rats, or a sign law question? Are you working out all the formulas and steps and getting the numbers that make sense given the concept? Does the y-intercept you found make sense on this Cartesian plane? Should it have been negative? Should it have been larger? If the values don't make sense, feel free to explain your reasoning and writing and validate that answer, whatever way you know how. End of the exam. Be sure to take your time and not rush through your answers. Use your time wisely. If you find yourself spinning your tires on a specific question, set it aside and come back to it later. Also, be careful on the long answer questions that you think you cruise through. Did you actually answer the question that they asked? Or did you just go through the motions thinking it was similar to one you've done before, or maybe even similar to the one you have on your memory aid? You are allowed an extra 15 minutes to complete the exam should you need the time. Take it. Check your answers and ensure that they make sense based on what was asked of you. Exam conditions in a student's IEP allowing extra time will also be respected. Be aware of how many minutes you have based on your IEP. Last but not least, if you need more information, please go to the following website. There are further documents that provide you more detailed information on everything, including creating your own memory aid. Good luck.